for joining to, um, today's session. And um, in our last class, we we're able to look at um, some concepts um, around um, investigation um, using the Microsoft Intra ID um, sign in logs, which is to going to go deeper in today's. And we're also able to look at um, understanding um, Microsoft Secure Score as well as um, analyze um, threat um, analytics. So we did a bit of work around um, each of the following. Then um, we also look at um, how we can configure the Microsoft Defender portal, right? Talking about different types of Defender portal email notifications, notifications around um, incidents, and as well as um, around um, threat um, analytics um, notifications. So in today's session, we're going to start a discussion on the, the Microsoft Entra ID protection. So here we want to see how um, this particular tool or this particular solution that Microsoft introduced to actually produce um, identity. So we'll be jumping straight into it. So in introducing this to right, the Microsoft Entra ID protection gives you an advanced detection and remediation of identity-based um, risks to protect your Microsoft Entra identity as well as um, applications. So if you're taking a scenario, for example, let's say you work for a retail organization that has um, its identity stored in the Microsoft Entra ID, which is actually the the new name for the Azure Active Directory. So, and there, there have been several recent um, incidents where identities um, were compromised. And it's possible that um, sensitive um, customer information were exposed. And um, you would like to use um, the Azure native services, right, to protect your company from any future incidents. And um, you've decided to have use um, the identity protection to actually protect um, your um, organization identity um, infrastructure. So we want to focus on two main important things. It's actually the things you asked last week around um, user sign-in policy, user risk policy, and also the sign risk, right? So uh, uh, our goal at the end of the uh, at the end of today's class is for you to know how to protect your um, your organization's identities from um, identity-based um, risks by using the identity protection. Now, if you talk about the Microsoft Entra ID identity protection, it's actually um, a solution, right? Like I said, that helps you to automatically detect, remediate, and um, investigate identity-based risks for your organization. So going back to our scenario earlier, the retail company that um, you work for is actually conscious about um, its reputation and um, compromised identities have previously enabled um, malicious users to maybe um, obtain customer information fraudulently. And um, that attack, what it does that it affects the organization's reputation and ultimately it will affect um, their profitability. So, and as as the soft engineer or as a as a security engineer, your manager has asked you to investigate um identity protection solution as a solution, and you've been asked to report back on what the service does and how it is actually being used. So, the identity protection solution is a solution built into the Microsoft Entra ID, and it is designed to protect um, your organization through three parts process. So the first process is um, it helps you with um, detection. It helps you with detection. It helps you with um, investigation, and it helps you with um, remediation. So the solution itself, so this is actually from an old documentation. My Microsoft was still naming it as um, Azure Active Directory Identity Protection. It's actually the same thing as the the new name is the Microsoft Entra ID Protection. So your companies um, actually specialize in uh, retail operations, not an identity protection. 
So and they actually want to continue to focus on um, its area of strength, but they still want to ensure that um, they are protected against identity risks. And so the organization can use the identity protection to automate the detection, the investigation, and as well as um, the remediation of risks related to users' identity without hiring expensive security experts. So even an, as an end user, maybe someone that set up the organization, right? With this solution, you can actually, you know, protect your identity um, infrastructure with this solution. So um, when we talk about what will actually, you know, prompt the organization to introduce this solution is actually all called risk. And what are risks? Risks, risks are like um, the things that are not unwanted in, in the organization, right? And risks are actually categorized um, into two ways. So we have um, the user risks and also the sign in risks. So we're going to actually go into understanding what each of these two are. So a user risk um, is caused, right? When a user um, identifies So for user risk now, it is caused when a user's um, identities or account is um, compromised. And user risk can actually include um, two things. The first one we'll call it an un unusual behavior. So for example, when an account shows unusual activity or the pattern of usage are similar to those patterns that Microsoft system and experts have actually identified as risk. Let's say, for example, now a user normally, you know, sign in for a particular location, right? Or a user who sign into their account and, you know, one or two documents, you know, they are frequently use applications. So those unusual behavior, uh, the Microsoft, um, the AI working at the back end has actually, you know, what the Microsoft um, expert and system and expert has actually, you know, use those AI models, right, to design the system. So when the system begins to see some unusual behavior, which is not um, the normal behavior of that particular um, user, then that user risk is actually, you know, fine. Then another um, risk under the user risk is um, leaked credential. Now for leaked credentials, maybe um, the user's credentials could have been leaked, for example, now, Microsoft may have found out a little credential on the top web, which will actually affect your user account. So let's say a user was sent a spam email and the user only went to go and click on the email. After opening the email, there was a link that the user now went to go and click on and that link automatically, the user's um, credential was harvested and it is being sold on dark web, right? So from there, um, those leak credential actually prompts the um, user risk. Now for the sign-in risk now, the sign-in risk now, what is happening here is that um, the identity protection um, actually um, do what we call synchronization, like it's here, yeah, it will sy synchronize um, each authentication request to judge whether the owner of this identity, right? Whether the owner of this identity is, um, is authorized to actually use it. And signing risks, for example, can include um, things around um, unfamiliar signing um, properties. Like for example, now the identity protections remembers and lends a particular user signing histories. For example, when a signing occur from a location that is unusual for the user, so a risk detection is triggered. Like in the place of um, impossible travel, for example, now, maybe a user was using um, a browser, let's say a Tor browser, for example, and the user had to sign in using that um, Tor browser and the IP, maybe the user normal IP is an IP in, in, in the West Africa, for example, now, and the IP that it's, it's seen is maybe is, is in North America or in the West Europe, right? So that's unfamiliar signing properties would trigger um, um, a signing risk. Then a typical travel also, which I mentioned. So for example, when two or more signing occurs from a distance location, 
in an unrealistic, un unrealistic manner, right? Short period of time. So a risk detection is actually risk. For example, again, using that particular, um, um, the example I gave earlier, user signing just within one second in this particular location, then maybe these are spin up a virtual machine um, in North America, maybe US and the sciences also within maybe one, two minutes, right? So that typical travel is also, um, it triggers a, a signing um, rigs. Then another um, things around um, the signing rigs is also, um, maybe there's a malware linked IP address. Uh, for malware linked IP address, for example, now, if it is known that the IP address where um, the signing originates has been in contact with an active uh, bot server, so a rich detection is also raised. So maybe you're using um, uh, some browsers and um, the particular IP that the user is signing in from, right? It's an IP that um, has been linked to a malware action using a bot, right? So that also um, triggers um, uh, signing errors. Um, another thing that um, triggers a signing errors is also an anonymous IP address. So you're signing in from any of those top browser, right? Even a top browser or any of those browser, right? To protect your IP, right? So when you sign, when the signing originates from an anonymous IP, so because attackers can use these details to hide their real IP address or location, so it also triggers um, a risk um, detection is also on race around it. So I hope that answers your questions that you asked last week about um, user risks and sign risks. Again, user risks um, is caused when user's identity or the account is compromised. Why for sign risks, the identity, each authentication request to judge um, whether the owner of the identity authorized um, it basically. And for user risks, it's going to be triggered around unusual behavior and also a link credential. Why for sign re signing risks, when you have an unfamiliar signing properties, a typical um, travel, a malware link IP address or um, anonymous um, IP address. Do you have any question around it? No, sir. Well understood now. All right. All right. I thought we'll still go more details after the session. So um, that's um, everything about the risk. Let's check the next one. So we want to look at the Microsoft um, Intra ID protection workflow. So there are two different diagrams here. Yeah? I'm going to explain um, what um, each of these diagrams is actually all about. So there are two different ways to detect and undo identity risks, right? The first one is what we call um, a self remediation, which is actually the first diagram up here, a self remediation. And the second one is what we call the administrator remediation. So now, what is a self um, remediation workflow? Now, the um, identity protections uses um, a risk policies to automatically respond to detected threats for you. And you can configure a risk policy to decide how you want identity protection to respond to a particular type of risk. Then you choose the action the user is asked to complete. And the action could actually be something around SSPR, which is self-service password reset or a, an MFA, which is a multi-factor authentication enforcement. So using policy this way helps save time and it gives you a peace of mind as an administrator because you've already configured it as a self remediation workflow. You don't want to actually get involved in the whole thing. So from here, as an admin, right? As an admin, you configure a risk policy here yeah? So once there is um, a risk detection, like we mentioned, whether it's a user risk or a signing risk, for example, now. So this, what this does is that it's, you are not involved again at all. So the user will be asked to do something. Either the user to reset their password. So once a um, single uh, self-service password reset has been enabled from the policy, right? That means user will be able to reset their password on their own. Right, or you actually um, enforce multi factor authentication. So, once let's say from this workflow here now, a password reset is actually what is required, then the user is actually notified via email that, oh, 
this there, there is there's something going wrong uh, that requires you to actually you know reset your password and the user will reset their password so the only place an admin is coming in is at the beginning here where the administrator configured the policy and the rest the admin will actually have a, a peace of mind and you save your time you can focus on other thing so um like i explained now uh, in the workflow for example now uh, the administrator first configure the risk policy then the risk policy then monitor for any identity risk and when a risk is detected right the policy enforce a measure to remediate it which is an example is password reset and um a policy might for example prompt user to reset their password or in response to the attack then the user will be notified via email and they reset their password once the password is reset automatically the risk is remediated that is a self remediation workflow for the Microsoft Entra ID protection. Why for in case of administrator uh, remediation workflow here? So an admin can also decide that, okay, how risk should be remediated when um, your policy, you know, when your risk policy detects it. And for an administrative workflow, for example, now is a type of remediation workflow that helps you to make more tailored decision. Right. So the, the, as an admin, the admin understand the contents in which um, the risk right, um, is being detected. So in the in the workflow for the administrator here, yeah, um, the admin configure the risk policy, right? Then um, the policy then monitor for any identity identity um, risk or user risk. Then so after that is done, a report will be generated. Once the report is generated, an admin is now notified of the risk, right, in the report. So once the admin is notified, what the, the next thing is that an admin still comes in here. If you can notice here, we have an admin in two, at two points here, but for this first diagram, admin is only showing in one point because the, the risk is, um, the, the, the report that has been generated is sent as a notification to the um, administrator. So once the admin view the detailed report, then the admin will not take um, appropriate actions to remediate the risks after investigating, you know, the activities. So then an action is on being taken to so an admin might decide that, okay, the signing is safe and, and the signing um, accept the risks like that. So once the risk is accepted and um, the user will be able to sign in um, appropriately. I hope um, that's clear. Yes, it's clear. Yeah. So um, it's safe to say that if the company want to uh, ensure less administrative um, intervention, they, mm -hmm. it's advised to use the self remediation workflow, right? So that right. way they don't, right? Yes, that's correct. So the admin was, is freed up to do other things, basically. Okay. Well, is it safe? Is it safer? Well, um, yeah, why the admin needs to intervene here majorly is to actually review the logs, right? So if um is an I is an I risk, for example, now, so most of the time it's always better to do an administrative remediation workflow. Or if it's a low or medium risk, you can do a self-remediation. At that point, you know that um if possible, if um the user account was actually compromised. Maybe the password, you know. So the at, at the point of um, performing that single um, sign on um, self service report, uh, self service password reset, there are a series of things that the user will need to do, which actually requires that if at all the user maybe for example now, so let's use the example of um, MFA enforcement for example now. So if the user has configured MFA at that point, right? So the user will be prompted. So the user had to you know use the Microsoft Authenticator app, or at the point of um, self-service password reset, a code will be sent either to the user's phone number, right, or it will be sent to the app that the user has configured at that point. So if it is truly that the user was the one performing that action, the user will be able to remediate that easily. But if it is a bad actor that saw the credential somewhere, but they know that a multi-factor authentication has been configured for that account, then at that point, that will not be done. But for an IRIX, I personally advise that for IRIX majorly, let there be administrator remuneration or workflow should be implemented so that an admin still 
get to see the report, right? And um, after revealing the report, he's going to perform investigation on it, then take action on it majorly. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so let's let's go further a bit. Um, but I'll take us back a bit because I want to discuss is still on that list. Now, for risk policy generally, um, risk policy makes it possible for your organization to respond uh, more appropriately to um, identifying risks. Now, um, previously, maybe from the scenario we painted now, the retail companies, IT team, they don't have any security skills in-house and they had to hire an external contractor, right, to protect identities. And um, your manager is on you. He's saying that, no, I want to avoid the same situation going forward. And um, the company needs to be able to, you know, respond to threats in a controlled and a more cost effective manner without weakening um, the security. And you as, um, as, as one of the in-house guy, you have been asked to investigate how to you know ident uh, uh, how the identity risks are detected in the um microsoft entry ID protection are you been asked to look into um the risk policy and how to use them um let me stop sharing the slide and let's go to the admin center for us to um look at this all right so um, if you are going to go into the Microsoft Entra ID protection, so unlike our activity where we've been doing everything from the Microsoft Twitter Admin Center, where we had to go into the um, Microsoft Defender Center, you know, to do one or two things there. In case of um, the Microsoft Entra ID, Microsoft Entra ID protection is not actually, um, you can actually assess it but one of the best way or the better way to um, assess it is um, through um, going into the um, Azure Microsoft um, Entra ID portal. Now in the Microsoft Defender portal, you won't see anything like Microsoft um, Entra ID protection here, rather just an identity dashboard here. But if you go here into identity, for example, I'm not sure it is there, but I, I want to actually confirm myself. Because Microsoft will be funny at times when they move things around. So I want to see if it is there. But I'm very sure 100% that it's actually in the Microsoft um, Azure portal. Let me see protection. Okay, identity protection. All right, so it's actually here. So under our Microsoft Entra identity, you um, actually see them here. And another way to actually see this is to go to the Microsoft Azure, right? In the Microsoft Azure, if you click on um, the, the hamburger icon, the menu icon, and you go into um, all services, then um, on the security service, I believe, if you go to security, so you should actually see the Microsoft Entra ID. Ah, it's strange that it's not here. So let me go to the identity part Is there, here. Look well. at it here. Okay, I, I saw it just now. It's under identity actually. Under security, you have okay. the Entra Privilege Identity Management here. So under identity, since you are speaking to identity, so definitely it will be under security okay. and protection for identity here. So that's okay. one way of actually getting there. Another way, uh, one of the fastest ways to just go into the search bar here and type in uh, Microsoft and Microsoft um, Entra ID, and it's Entra ID Identity Protection. Entra ID Protection. So you see it there. So it's still the same thing as what we could see under the Identity Protection here. So let's stay here for the um. For the Azure part. So once you go into portal.azure.com, right? You type in Microsoft um Entra ID identity protection, you'll be able to, you know, it will navigate you into the identity protection 
presentation dashboard. Now, um, this dashboard gives you an overview, right, um, of things like things around the number of attacks that this identity protection has blocked on your behalf, the number of users that were protected. So this gives you the details for the past 12 months. Then the mean time to remediate IRIX user, right? The number of IRIX user. So the dashboard basically gives you an overview, right? So if there is anything coming in from any part of the world, maybe risk activity by location, it's also giving a map to show that, okay, this risky activity is coming from this particular um, location, right? Then uh, yeah, under the number of attack blocks, you can click on view attacks to see the attack blocks. So you'll be able to see different, um, you know, attacks based on um, detection type. I think it's just one detection type I have here. But let's go back again. So for our risk policy, like I mentioned, right, it's you can configure um, risk policy to detect how you want um, identity protection to um, respond to a particular type of risk. And um, maybe do you want to block or you allow access or do you want to make users to go through more authentication before you allow access? So basically the risk policy helps you respond to risks rapidly. And um, as an organization, you can apply risk policies and avoid even hiring um, external contractors to undo anything around um, identity um, based risks. And based on the type of identity risks, um, different risk policies are actually um, available. So you can either use um, under protection here. If you go here, you will see two policies. You have the user risk policy and we have um, the sign in policy. So if you are going to talk about, let's talk about the sign in risk policy force. So for a sign in risk policy, um, it's actually, actually um, scrutinize um, every sign in and gives you um, a risk score. After synchronizing every sign in that you have, then and this cause um, basically um, indicates the ability that the person whose credentials are used are actually the one attempting to sign in. And you can decide which level of risk is acceptable by choosing a threshold of either low, medium, or high. Because you'll be able to see this here. If you click on this sign in risk, for example, now you're seeing low and above, you're seeing medium and above, you're seeing a high here. And um, you will choose whether you want to allow access um, or automatically uh, no, block or allow access only after other requirements are met. For example, maybe users might be asked to go through multi factor authentication to remediate detected risks that are actually considered to be at the medium level. And users could be blocked you know, entirely if um, the risk is considered um, high. And another thing for, for general sign-in risk policy now, you use a form to actually configure you know, a sign-in risk policy majorly from the Azure portal by specifying settings such as um, the user risk policy should actually target who. For example, now, if you click on now, in terms of assignment now, by default, yeah, if you click on this, this is currently set to all the users, right? And also, you can also set a condition, right? The condition that must be met, such as how high a score should actually trigger, you know, the policy, then how do you want to respond to make sure that, um, users are actually either already signed in or register for the Microsoft um, intra multi-factor authentication or before you actually, you know, apply um, the risks. So those are the things that um, you can actually, you know, consider. So for this now, let's say I want to create the sign in risks for, from selected users, for example, now, I select the selected users, so I can just select these. Let me select these users, this and this, for example, now. So the policy I want to apply to this group, probably those people, those users are like the C-level executive. That I know that um, bad actors, you know, want to actually target then after selecting. So I know that those are the users that are included. Now, if you actually select all here, 
before like before I jump, if you actually select all here, what it means is that every user in the organization, you know, will actually be affected. But you have the option to select or and exclude. So let's say I just want to exclude um the there's an account called um the the break class account. So that break class account is like a scenario. Let's say there's a there's a cyber attack on now. There's one funny picture I saw that um if there's any cyber attack, so they place it on a server rack. It just disconnects all the network cables. So break the glass and disconnect all the network cables. So maybe um we don't want um these policies to affect, especially in the case of using um the conditional access policy, which one of the things you will see in our discussion, right? So you want to exclude a, some set of users or a particular group in the organization now. You just come to exclude and you click on this to select who are the users or who are the groups that you would like to you know exclude here so if you have if you have different groups you just come under groups and say okay i want to exclude um groups around uh, maybe i created the groups okay let me say there's some groups called not waste sales for example now i want to um exempt them right what is going to happen is that this signing risk policy will be applied to all users except this group I'm putting as an exclusion, right? So I don't want to do that right now, so I'll close that. So let's go back to my include, then click on the selected. So I want to focus on some, some group of users, right? So I selected these, selected these, and selected these. Then click on select. So those users will actually be listed here. Right after that, so we can actually you can actually click on the, um, the sign in risks. What is the risk level? So you configure user risk level needed for the policy. Okay, I want um this select this control to be enforced when um it is actually I for this user, right? So once I'm I'm sure that I want to focus on just I or medium and above, as the case may be. I say medium and above, and I click on done here. Then in terms of con what is the control that I want to, you, you know, respond with, right? How you want to actually respond. Okay, I want to I want to ensure that once this risk for these three users is actually medium and above, block, right? So if I want to block that means I'm, once that is detected, automatically the user will be blocked from signing in based on this policy. But if I say allow access, you can just select allow access, right? If you select allow access now, you have to require, you know, multi-factor authentication. So that means those users are signing in and that signing risk policy has been triggered. So it's now enforces them to actually, you know, use um the multi-factor authentication and click on done. Once you click on done, so you have this option here. Do you want to enable or disable? So for now, the policy is still disabled. Just toggle it here and the policy is enabled. Then you can click on save to save um, the policy. So to tell you that the policy has been saved. Any question? Huh? All right. Okay. All right, so started reading everything right now. So after a signing risk is identified based on this policy, the user is asked to take actions, right, to make to remediate the risk. So they are told what triggered the risk and what they need to actually provide to resolve the issue. For example, now user might in a situation like, okay, um, we want to protect your accounts, right? You have detected something unusual about the signing, for example, maybe signing in from a new location or device. So that notification is actually you know, triggered for the user, and the user is able to know that okay, there's actually um a machine learning um AI in the back end trying to monitor my signing and um it triggers the signing um risk policy. All right, so the next one we want to look at is the user risk policy. Now, for user risk policy, right? Yeah, what is happening is that the identity um, section blends the user's normal behavioral pattern. 
right? It lends the user's normal behavioral pattern and the identity protection then uses this knowledge to calculate the likely risk that the user's identity was compromised. Now, based on this risk, the admin can decide whether to allow access, block it, or allow access only after extra requirements are met. And the user could, for example, be asked to change their password by using um, the cell service password reset that we mentioned earlier before they are allowed access. So um, the use actually this, this particular, um, if, you, if you click on this user risk policy, that's what you use to configure the policy on the Azure portal. And you can specify um, um, specific settings such as the users that this policy should actually target or the condition that must be met on how you want to respond. Now you have to make sure that users are already registered for the self-signing password reset before you apply this policy. So one of the mistakes that admin does is that policy like this uh, will be created and you find out that um, users are not actually enabled for SSPR, self-service password reset. And when this triggers, they are unable to actually reset the password. That means the admin is causing more problems. So the prerequisite for this policy is that a self-service password reset um, will have already been configured for the user. So it's the same way too, very easy. So for the user experimentation policy, it's currently applied to all users. So which I don't want it to apply to all users. I can say, okay, exclude. So for this one, let me just say all user words exclude. Let me just exclude this particular accounts. This will be global admin accounts that I'm currently using. Okay. So it's applying to all users except this. Then I click on select. So I know that everybody is being affected except this user. So what is the user risk level? So I can see, okay, configure the user risk level needed for policy to be enforced. So I want this to just be I alone. Unlike the other time that I selected medium and above, I want to be I alone and I'll click on done. Then what is the control for this now? So the control for this I want to leave. So I can leave it as because it is always recommended to block access. So I let it be that um, an admin based on uh, the, the workflow, the admin workflow, right? You're able to get notifications that, oh, the particular user has been blocked and you'll be able to investigate and remediate it. So in situation where you're selecting I, right? Ensure that you block, then um, you click on done here. Yeah. So you can actually select allow and multi-factor authentication is also configured, right? is based on your organization policy. So for any policy changes like this, it's always best, like in my organization today now, before we enable any policies around security, um, there, there are like three teams that are actually aware. Our enterprise architecture team are aware. Our technology governance and operations is also aware. Then our security team, they're also aware so that this changes now. It goes through a change management process, right? We raise a change request, and from the change request, once it's approved, we actually, you know, shout out as well, so that people are aware that this policy is currently being um, enabled for the um, entire organization. Then once everything is done, enable it. Once it's enabled, and you save it. So every user in the organization, apart from the um, admin account that was excluded, who actually, you know, have this policy um, being um, enforced for them. So after the um, user risk policy is actually um, identified, users take actions to remediate. So if at all I didn't block access here, I selected um, allow access, um, you know, and the allow access, if you notice the two, the two difference is that this one requires a um, password change, right? So let me leave it as this. Let me save it to require password change. But for signing a policy, what did you notice? It tells you that let them uh, perform a multi-factor authentication. So that's one major difference between the user risk policy and the signing poli policy. So if you click, if you check this again. So this is talking about require multi-factor authentication. So one major difference why this is talking about required uh, password 
change. So you have to actually take note of that. So one of the things, um, once that, that risk is like this particular user risk is triggered, so um, the user is asked to take actions to regulate the risk, and they are told what's triggered a risk and what they need to provide to resolve the issue, which is an example, they must reset um, their password. Now, another concept that is also very important under this Microsoft Intra ID protection is all called the Microsoft the Motor Authentication Registration Policy. Now, if you click on this, right, for the multi-factor registration policy, right, what it does is that it adds a second layer of protection to your user's identity. Now, with multi-factor authentication, the user has to go through an extra verification steps after they successfully provide their username and their password, right? And you can use an MFA registration policy to make sure that all users are registered for Just going to be onboarded, they just employ them, right? And um, user credential has been created for them. And you want to ensure that at the time of signing up for the first time, they are and um, they are they are required to actually you know perform multi-factor authentication registration, right? So with the with the help of this multi-factor authentication registration MFA, right? They it will help them to ensure that um they register for MFA from the first time. The user account, and you can also configure this policy so that you can enforce sign in um, bricks policy. This way, you actually let your users to self remediate after the sign in risk is detected. You remember the sign in risk works with what the multi factor authentication, why um, the user risk works with what SSPR for users to actually you know, reset their password. So you select this um, um, for the policy name is called multi factor authentication policy. And you want, in terms of assignments, you want to assign to all users, right? You want to assign to all users, or you want to select individual users or group. But I'm going to leave it at all users. And in terms of control, so the control, you can see that this by default is grayed out. You cannot even change it, right? So required um, Microsoft Entra ID multi factor authentication registration. So currently um, is disabled, right? You can also enable it. Now you can see um, in notification that says that multi factor authentication registration policy only affects cloud based Azure MFA authentication. And if you have a multi factor authentication server, it's not be affected. So Microsoft used to have an on prem server called um, uh, multi-factor authentication, which was actually retired last month, right? So every user has been asked to come to the cloud. But before now, when that was the effect, so organizing that are using both the on-prem MFA server and the one that is in Azure multi-factor authentication, anything you configure here, that one is only telling you that it will only affect the cloud-based um, identity. So only the users that are actually, it affects the Azure multi-factor authentication, not um, the um, the multi factor um, server that's MFA server on prem that was actually um, required. So after you configure the MFA registration policy, the user is asked to register when they sign in, and um, the user will see things around them um, at the point of registration, which I can demo that. But you see things around them, um, more information is required. That is always the screenshot tell you more, more information is required. I the organization need more information to keep your account um secure. So it is very important that as soon as the user receives that particular um notification, the user must complete the registration within 14 days. So the user will always have 14 days. So some can even say skip for the next 14 days. Second day, skip for the next 13 days. The third day, skip for the next. But the moment it is 14 days, they will not be able to skip again. They will be required to actually, you know, do it. But they can choose to skip, like I said, signing in during the period. But after 14 days, they have to complete the registration before they are allowed to sign in up again. Any questions so far? So let me save this.
Um, no, no question. All right. Awesome. So the next thing we want to look at, which is actually the last part of our discussion today around um, Microsoft Intra Identity Protection, is talking about the investigation, right? So now we've talked about the protection part of this plate, right? We should talk about the so consider I say it's something is a different topic that we're gonna actually, you know look at in more detail is a topic on its own, right? I just I just focus that you don't want to you know mention it, but it's part of our topics that um we'll look at. So we've talked about the users as under the protection, we talk about the user risk policy, talk about the sign your risk policy as well as the multi-factor authentication for registration policy. Now under the reports side of things, so we have other things there, right? Now, in investigation, we'll talk about configuring the policy. Now, after the policies are triggered, what are the things that as an admin um, we can do? So investigation helps you to understand how you can actually improve your identity security posture. If you remember, we talked about um, last week, Microsoft Defender School when we saw identity data applications, right? And um, one of the things that since um, Entra ID protection is all about, um, about identity. So in terms of investigation, you are improving your identity um, secure, security posture. And it's that makes it possible for you to respond to risk better. And it helps you to avoid risk in the future. Now, going back to the scenario again that we're using in um, the retail company that you're working with. Now, you have configured the Microsoft Entra ID protection policies and risks are being detected. Now, your manager has asks you to investigate and remediate all the risks detected and for you to share a report with the project manager that you're working with on that project. And the team uses it to understand um, the company identity big risks. Give me one second. How to take what I Right, sorry about that. My throat was drying up. So um the team uses it to understand um the company's um identity based risks. So for under the investigation part that's talking about the report, our focus is to um actually you know learn how to investigate risks by using reports and uh, we also see how to remediate different types of um risks and as well as deal with um any user accounts that might be blocked. So remember the policy that I wanted to configure earlier on the user risk policy that will say, OK, block, you know, since it's a password required to. Let me leave it. Let me say this as block and click on done and save this. So let's say this policy is actually what you actually configured, right? We want to ensure that we want to protect our users at all costs. So any high risk, so far as an high risk, tag an high risk, wants it to be blocked. Now, how do you know as an administrator that, oh, some user has been blocked, apart from them calling in to reporting that ah, my account has been blocked, or I can see one error, maybe they take a screenshot and share with you via WhatsApp, you know, or via other means, that see what I'm experiencing, my account is blocked, or maybe as an admin, you've configured um, in such a way that you're able to receive notification based on um, those reports. Now, for in terms of um, investigating risks, right, identity protection, provide reports you can use to investigate and also anything around them, identity based risks you know detected for your organization's users and what this report does is that they come in different types for example in each kind of report gives the admin information about certain risks and the admin can then take specific actions to or um, to address Uh, you see that we have um, risky users, 
we also have um, the risky signings, right? Now, I think um, this is one of the questions that you actually you actually asked last week as well. Now, for risky signings, you now for risky signings, what it does is that it um, let me go to risky signing here. What it does is that um, the information that are actually available for risky signings are things um around um the location detail, right? You know, the device detail. You see things like the signing, you know, confirmed as safe or with dismiss or remediated risks. Now, the action that an admin can take is um, you can confirm that the signings are safe or confirm that the signings are, are compromised. And the period that this covers is only in the last 30 days. Now, if I come down to the report blade here, for example, and this would definitely, there are a lot of risky signings, like there are a lot of users, right, performing this app. few hours before our class, right? So I have this report here for me. Now I'm able to see things, the dates and the time that this happened. So I, I can see that it was today around um, 4, 17 p.m., just a um, few minutes before our class. And it gives me the details of the user that is affected, right? And the IP address that this um risky signing is coming from, then also the location, right? As well as the state. So the risky state is I'm um, talking about um is our tricks. If I click on these three ellipses here, it's going to give me more details about the user's risk reports, the user's signings, the user's risk risky signings, then user's risk detection, and also the, the signing detection. Now the other one, I'm going to go into them, but let me just explain the other one now. The risky user here. You know what this does is that it lists for me um, the list of users at risk and users with either dismiss or remediated risks, also user histories um, as well as um, the risky signings. Right now, for an admin, admin can take actions such as reset the user's password or dismiss the user risk or block the user signings and also the user accounts as compromised. And this period that this one is covered is not um it's not applicable. You have all the details available for, for you there. So let's go back to the risky signing and you know just go into some of the reports. Now it is very important for you to note that you can use these two reports, both the risky users as well as um, the risky signings to investigate risks that are detected by um, the identity protection. And the report helps you to understand how you better prevent risks and also improve your security stance for your identities. So for this first user now, like for example now, you can see the basic info about the users. So it tells me that the request ID for the users, then the correlation ID, these are things that Microsoft use from the back end. Then the type of signing, so it's an interactive signing. Then the user, so the user mail, user ID is there. Then the application that the user was trying to sign into, as well as the application ID, then resource. So it gives you the details about um, this users under the, the basic info. Then for the device info, right, you're able to see, okay, where was this done? The browser that was used, oops, browser, pretty system of the device. Then in terms of compliance, is it, is it device compliance? No, is it device managed? No. So it's telling me that this device is not, this is not signing into a device that has been joined to the organization um, Microsoft Entra ID. That's what it's actually telling me there. Then if I go under the risk info here, so the risk info tells me what is actually happening. So it tells me that if I click on drop down, I'm seeing that this is an, actually an anonymous IP, which is actually at risk. So for the risk states, it tells me, okay, the time detected, same information that I have here, then um, the risky state is a real time, the risk level. 
So it marks the risk level as high. So I'm I'm sure that if this user was part of user have configured um the policy for to block this user, that means the user will not be able to sign in again. Then the source of this information is coming from what the identity protection. So I'm able to see all that information like the signing time again, the same IP address, then the signing location as well as um the signing um clients that was used, then the token issuer also there. Then um if I want to get multi-factor authentication info. So it tells you that construction of potential info gives me things around um, the results, the odds method and the details. So if there's any conditional assets, you know, that was actually, you know, created and assigned to this particular user, I'm going to be able to see that here. So conditional assets is something we're going to actually, you know, look at in a different session. Then in terms of this, so it gives me things around um, reports only. There are things that um that have to do with just um reporting for the user. So I'm able to see that. So other things I can see under these um, risky signings is, if you check this tab up here, so this now I'm not selecting this user, right? So just this tab up here without selecting any of the logs, I can download this report. So no matter the number of reports that are here, number of users that are actually being marked as um, risky signings, right? Number of signs are being marked risky signings, either for these users or for any other users in the organization, right? I can download the reports here. So it, this actually gives me more to, to learn more about things around um, the risky signing. Then for the export data settings, if I go into that, I'll be able to see, um, to be able to see, um, to view if there's any other things I can actually do in terms of um, checking um, diagnostic settings, but you're not touching that. Um, go back. So I'm able to also configure trusted IPs. So if there are IPs that I feel that uh, they are trusted and they are being, you know, backed, okay, maybe user wants to go to a particular location, you know, and user will be signing from a particular IP. I'm able to, you know, configure that on that um, the trusted IP. Check this. Then if I need to troubleshoot with the support of the Azure Azure portal, maybe get some things I can use to actually troubleshoot that I can do that. Now, if I click on this select owner, it's going to actually select everything I have on this list, right? So if I select one here, but because it's just one, so that's why it's selecting everything here for me. So selecting all is something as selecting the date here, right? If I select it, then I can confirm as an admin. Okay, oh, from my investigation, this particular signing is actually it shows that it's suspicious and I'm guess I'm, I'm thinking or I know that the user is compromised. So I'll have the option to confirm that the signing is actually a compromised signing. But if I feel that the user is, maybe the user actually travel and the user forgets to actually inform that, oh, sorry, I'm actually traveling and um, I forgot to inform that I'll be signing in from a different location and all that. So with that, I can actually confirm the signing C for that users then um, I can as well dismiss um, the signing risk for the user. Then for us to actually, you know, remediate the risk. So when your investigation is actually complete, you want to remediate the risk. So if you are not already using the risk policies to actually automatically deal with them, so it's always good to actually address any detected um, risk quickly. And there are different ways that I mentioned earlier that we can actually, you know, remediate the risk. Now, one of the way is actually the self remediation. Now, with self remediation, if you configure the risk policies, you can let the user, you know, self remediate. How do I mean? So, when identity protection has detected a risk, so users either reset their password or go through the multi-factor authentication to unblock themselves. So that's self remediation, and after self remediations, these um detected risks are considered closed. So in your in your risk policies, the lower the acceptable risk level that triggers a policy, the more users are affected. So if you are setting your risk policy to low and above, for example, now 
more users will be act, uh, will be actually be affected. You know, just see that they got just getting lockouts. You know, they are getting flagged and all that because you set to, when you set your risk acceptable level to high. For example, now it's only those high risk that will actually you know be considered as risk, and um, you have um less work. And the more the users are affected, in general, we recommend that you um you set the um threshold for users risk policy as high and the signing risk you know policy to medium and above so that's actually the general recommendation from microsoft set the user risk policy to high then set um, the signing risk policy to medium and above so that you don't just get you know as an admin they are not just going to be looking at a lot of risky um reports down here and the other method apart from safe remediation is to actually reset password manually so for some organizations right so automated password resets might not be an option like for my for my for my own organization to dinner i tell you for a fact that we have we are not using our feature of self-service password resets in the azure for just now we're just considering it but we have a third party solution that we use right now that third party solution is actually linked to our um our domain controller on on-prem not on azure because most of our users are sync users users that are um a hybrid users let me just put it like that sync users sync from ad they are not cloud only users right so for self-service password reset except you have to configure the password right back in which um users can reset their password and the password you know will sync back to on-prem so that's when. So for that manual, when when the organization is an organization that actually is a manual option, so users cannot perform the SSPR. So what happen in that case is that the admin can manually enforce password reset. For example, now the admin can generate a temporary password and advise the user. Then the user can actually change their password either on the Active Directory domain controller or depending on what um, the organization is using. So that's the second way. After the self remediation the second is uh, the reset password manually. Now the third um, way is, um, the, or the third method for remediation is what we call, you can dismiss user risk detection. Now, if you see from here now, for this user now, because I know that I'm just playing, I'm just testing, I'm aware, I'm the one doing all this action, right? So I can just dismiss, these are signing risks now. So sometimes the password reset isn't actually possible. For example, maybe the affected accounts was deleted. And in this case, you can dismiss um, the risk detection for these users, right? Maybe this has already left the organization. So if we choose to actually dismiss the user risk detection or the associated risk detection for these users are closed automatically. So if I click on the SNA, so everything for this user has been listed under the risk designing for this user, everything will be closed because one, the user is no more part of the organization. Two, the account of the user has been deleted. So there's no point having um, the user's reports as part of um, the data. Then the last method is to close individual detections. Now, all detected risks contribute to the overall score for a user. So let's say the user has been, has been, has been flagged the one, the five, the 18, the 25 of a particular month, for example, now. So it actually aggregates and it becomes the overall risk score for that user. So this risk score represents the probability that the user account is compromised. And, the, and as an admin, you can also choose to close the individual risk detection and the lower the overall risk of a user's account. For example, now the admin can determine from a user's that a particular risk detection is no longer needed. And then the admin can actually you know, dismiss it and the overall risk that the user account was compromised will actually be lowered. Now, if you go back to the risky user here. So for the risky user, let me unselect this. So the same, so it's almost look alike, only that for here, this gives you details about the user, the risk state, and also the risk um, last updated. But if you go to risky signing now, this gives you more you know, information about um, 
the risk. So it tells you about, gives you more details. Talk about the users, talk about the IP address. It tells you about the location. So it gives you more details about this. Why for the risk user? It's just the detail for um, the user bit majorly. Now, now for this now, you can perform a, a reset of password here, right? I don't want to do that. So this actually gives you basic more information about the users. If you check this, the information this is giving you under the risky user, and if you compare with this risky signing, right, you find out that they are actually quite different. Let me duplicate this. So this is the risk signing. So it's giving you more details, like it's giving things as as things like your user ID, the application, right? That user is trying to sign into. But if you go here, the risk user. So I want to compare both. So if you if you check it too. We would say that this is giving you more information than the second one. Okay. Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Yes, so, go ahead. All right. So, does it mean issues surrounding scenarios where an organization has uh, well over, uh, let's say, 500 uh, users and there are um, alerts, frequent alerts, uh, frequent signing alerts that are false positives. So such scenarios can be controlled using the sign in policy to uh, to increase the uh, to reduce the uh, the risk level and also probably do some More exclusions. Alerts. Right. Yes. 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 Okay. So that's actually the goal. The, the idea is to ensure that um, we reduce the, the level of the uh, the first person that we have in the organization, right? So it's always advisable for one, set it as I. So it's only the I, or I information, I risk that you get. Why the other one, medium and above, right? So that is the one that, so the Microsoft system has actually seen that which one is always coming up. So the one that is set I, which is the, the signing um, policies, right? It's always coming as so it's always advised to that okay set this one as I so that what's what you are bringing what what the admin or the engineer will be getting is actually pertaining to those I alerts so you don't bother yourself about um the other ones that's a low alert yeah. yeah so yeah so again for this now see the basic info that the risky user details is giving you here so it's only giving you things about the user the role of the user the email address then the risky state and the risky level, right? Then it's the other details around them, maybe the user's office location, department, and the phone number. Why on the other hand here, the risky signing details is giving you more details, even as far as the application that the user is trying to sign into, right? The status of the risk, right? Gives you the location, which you don't have for this other one, the IP address, the resource, and as well as resource ID. So that gives you more information. Then it, uh, this also gives you device info, right? The operating system that was used. So I'm not sure if this is correct anyway, because I'm not sure. I'm actually on Windows 11 and the browser I use was actually a top browser. But again, it gives you the device info, right? And why this? You don't have anything that has to do with um, device info. So this gives you um, a risk info as well. So another information that is very, very useful, the risk state, the risk level, you know, risk details, the source. So it gives you more details. Uh, for what you have here is um, the risk history. So this tells you, okay, when and when has this occur for this particular users, right? So you're able to see that there was one at um, the 5th of, sept of September, which is also like a month. So this time ago, and it's time as low. There's another one that same day as well, but different time. Then there's another one today, right? So it gives you the risk history. So depending on what you want to see, both reports, both the risky signing details, we give you some particular reports, information that you need. Why um 
the risky um, user details you give you a different information. Then other information this gives you is the most fatal authentication information, right? Which this does not give to you. Rather, you have the gives you risk recent risk signing. So if there are some risk recent risk signings and um, things around them. So it tells you. So this is now where you are getting more information here for this. So it tells you the application, right? The failure. So it's almost the same thing that you are getting from the status failure and the application, right? Then the IP address is also here for you. So the way the reports, so you can see that the reports are almost the same thing, only that this gives you a risk level for return to be high. Why the risk level in terms of aggregate taking the average, then this risk state, it gives you that for that. Then detection that is not linked to signing. So if there are other detection for that particular users, but it's not related to signings, it's this will actually give you the support. So basically, both the risky user details and as well as um, the risky signing details are actually giving you um those um information for you. Then um the risk risky um workload identity. So if there are some service principles, right? You have some workload that pushes identity states, which is actually all you're not considering right now, right? Those service principles that you use, I don't currently have any service principles on this account. Can also this will give you those identity. Then um there's an any risk detection, right? So this risk detection gives you those other details too, that is part of um, the same thing that you're seeing, the token issuer, like, so everything is majorly, you know, related because those data are giving you, based on the the way you want to actually, you know, see those um information. All right, so let me just maximize this back. Now, for unblocking users, so I mentioned that, um. You have the option to if the, if the user is actually compromised, let me go to the user sign in, for example, and let's see the reason the user has been blocked, for example. Now, so for unblocking users, when um there's a risk policy that blocks a user account or an admin blocks an account manually after investigation. So um there are actually different ways in which I'm the user accounts are out blocked depends on the type of risk that actually um, causes um, the blockage. Now, if the accounts are blocked because of signing risk, what happens is that an account blocked because of signing risk can be unblocked by excluding the user from the policy. And the account might be unblocked if the admin asks the user to sign in from a familiar location or device. So if, let's say, for example, now, I earlier I wanted to demo something. So I just remember that it's going to actually trigger this sign in. I wanted to demo on a Microsoft SQL score for you in the production environment. It's one of the tasks that I'm currently working on, right? But I just remember that, that, oh, we have this policy set up. If I'm going to do that on this, my personal system, even though I won't have the session recorded, but I am going to trigger it and I don't want that to happen because it should be flat from the back end. So that's why I just say, let me leave that for now. So because um, sometimes signings are actually blocked from unfamiliar locations and devices, even though I can actually sign into my production accounts for my organization on my personal laptop but it's not advisable because of all these risky signings and all of that. So um, there, might, there might be an alert for suspicious behavior based on what is known about the user's account signing pattern. And the policy can also be disabled if they are found, the admin found issues with it. So any of this policy that you configured, especially the signing of group policy, and it's giving an issue, right? It's better to just go back and just disable the policy so that um, all those problems that you're encountering as an admin, you have your peace of mind. Just imagine in a day, 20 people or 30 people are saying that, ah, I'm blocked, I'm blocked. And you have to start, you know, working with them, doing the update support work, even when you're supposed to be focusing on deploying solutions, right? So it's just better to, you know, you disable those policies until you're able to figure out the best way to, you know, 
push out the policy to the users across it. And it then needs to actually exclude some users. We know that these particular users, maybe the user is in sales. These are get to travel to different parts of the country or let's say different parts of the world to, you know, get clients. And these are need to sign in, right? In such a situation, you can't come up policy to block such users. You have to either, you know, um, exclude the users, right, from such policies. And when you have a situation whereby the account is blocked because of user risks. So the first one we talk about is because of signing risks, right? If his account is blocked, in the second instance, if the account is blocked because of, of the user risks, now, an account can actually get blocked if the user was flagged because of possible um, risky behavior. So what the admin can do is that admin can actually reset the password for the user to unlock the account, to remove the block, the admin might actually dismiss the activity that was identified as risky or exclude the user from the policy. So if, we, if we, this particular user now, let's say this particular user is blocked based on this policy now, I say you should block access and I look for, for the, the risky users, right? Now I can dismiss the user risk, reset the password and dismiss some of the user risk. I don't want to do that, right? So that's what you need to do to remove the block, like I said, the admin might need to dismiss the activities, identify as a risky or exclude the user from the policy. And again, if the policy is causing problems for many users, what you can do as an admin to have your peace of mind, you can completely disable the policy, right? So it's actually Microsoft recommendation to actually, you know, disable the policy. Do you have any questions so far? Any question? No. Okay. So you said the risk users report uh, one can only investigate uh, the last 30 days, right? It only saves the reports for 30 days. So for for the two of them, the risk signing saves for the last 30 days. Why for the risk users, it doesn't have any period cover. So it's not applicable. You see all of them there. So if there are 100 users that are affected, you see them there. But the risky signings are things that cover, it's covered for the last 30 days. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So we'll be running up okay. to this Sorry. class. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry, let me. So now, if one is to investigate risky signings, for the last 90 days, one can use the um, risk detention detection policy instead of risk signing uh, reports. So for risk detections, yeah, as mm -hmm. you're talking about this, right? Yes, risk detection reports. So for, for risk detection, let me set the time here. So yes, you can use this, yes, that's what you use. So the maximum okay. time is 90 days. Yeah. So if you need to get those detections, so you can do this for 90 days and this will provide it for you. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. So if you are going to look at other settings, like maybe a weekly digest, which is not actually, you know, common, right? So users in the global admin and security administrator or um, security that will automatically add to this case. If the user has a valid email, or alternative email configured. So this sends email to the first sent member of each row. So if you just so this is not even what well is just something that Microsoft does for a weekly digest. Okay. Then also for user at risk detected. So if you're a global admin, just tell us the global admin, security admin or security readers are automatically added to this mix, right? So far, they have a valid email. So I think all these guys, they are all admin that have a valid email. And um, the same emails, the first members. So there's nothing much here. So the major thing under identity protections are under protect and as well as report. Those are the two places that then this troubleshooting is just for you to raise it. Maybe there's something that is happening. You're not getting it like what I saw earlier. You can just contact Microsoft with this. Which is for request with Microsoft, which I don't think is free again because I think it's now paid to get support for for reads, and this can also you know guide you on um, 
possible solutions, maybe documentations that you want to check. And also, if you want to go into, you know, checking more details. So here also provide different tutorials for you, talking about what is ID protection, how to use it. So even from the other things that you're able to see, then this talks about different overviews and concepts to understand more details about it, then how to, so how to guide, configure risk policy, how to investigate. So this, these are documentations that are actually um, very useful. Then again, the dashboard gives you overview. You're able to see attack, how many users are protected, um, enable the risk policy, the view I risk users. So I mean, that's, that is actually the end for today's class. So let me just stop sharing a second.